Hi, welcome everybody to today's ODI Friday's Lunchtime Lecture. I'm Hannah, I'm the Head of Marketing and Membership here. Uh, thanks for coming along today and thanks to everyone watching on the live stream. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce my colleague Olivier through our Head of Tech at the ODI. And Olivier will be talking today about a two-year uh, collaboration project between the University of Surrey and the National Archives to see whether we can use technology to make archives or digital archives more trusted. Uh, over to you, Olivier. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And hi, everyone. I'm uh, very pleased to be here today. Um, so this will be a, um, as usual for ODI Friday Lectures, this will be streamed. Uh, so there will be time for questions here in the audience as well as on Twitter. So you can use the hashtag ODI Fridays to ask us any question. Um, today I want to uh, talk about trust, but not necessarily trust in the way that you may have heard uh, us at the ODI talk about uh, in recent times. So recently we've been talking a lot at the ODI about ethics and trust in data stewards, in making sure that we have trust in how data is being collected, used and shared. Today I want to talk about trust in much broader sense, trust in truth, trust in institutions. And I've been um, rather um, fascinated and slightly obsessed by something that happened late last year. And I, and I got a capture of a, of a tweet uh, because Freya told me not to use videos ideally if possible. But the, this, is a, this is something that happened um, late last year whereby uh, there was a bit of a spat between a journalist and the press secretary at the White House. And in order to uh, justify their decision to ban the journalists from CNN from the White House press briefings, the White House used a video that showed or purportedly showed uh, the journalist assaulting, I'm putting big quote marks around that, a staffer uh, at the White House, basically uh, saying, no, you cannot take the mic away. So I'm going to do that to you afterwards. I'm keeping the microphone. Uh, more seriously, the, 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 the essence of the spat was whether the video that the White House used was doctored or not. The video appeared to have been sped up in just the right way, in really, really subtle way, you're, you're talking just a few frames, to make it look like uh, the journalist was basically chopping, using a chopping movement rather than a push. And the, the people who uploaded the video said, oh, that must be some kind of artifact of uploading the video to the system. You know, it gets uh, the, the encoding changes and things like that, but we didn't do anything like that. And that, that was a, you know, it, it is somewhat anecdotal. It's not uh, necessarily a huge uh, um, uh, happenstance. It's a huge event. And we've got, we've got a lot of history of... Um, images and uh, um, records being, let's say, uh, tweaked or uh, doctored to uh, to serve political gains. I think the uh, the history of uh, uh, um, image manipulation in uh, Soviet Russia is absolutely fascinating. You've got actually quite a lot of photos of people standing next to Stalin and disappearing one by one. This is a really great example. You need, the, chronologically, is this way. It, they started being four, then three, then two, and eventually you just have Stalin on that photo. Or is it a photo? I think by that point, they basically just made it into a, 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 a painting. Uh, and so the problem that we've got today is that, sure, you still have that kind of notion of trying to disinform or misinform, depending on how you want to ascribe uh, a will in that uh, issues with information being imperfect. But the problem is that we've got now a triple threat of that will to, to, to misinform or disinform, tools that allow you to do that. Photoshop here uh, being used as, a, as an exemplar for a lot of tools, including more recently things like deepfakes, the ability to create very uh, uh, convincing videos of famous people doing things they never did and saying things they never said. And then the democratization of the use of those tools and the democratization of the broadcasting of that content that things like the internet provide. So we've got that, 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 that triple threat that means basically that trust in the record is being eroded. There's no truth anymore, and you've got you know, social commentators saying this, that's it. Those three things mean that we are in the age of post-truth. 
And that leads me to thinking about uh, this uh, venerable organization. For those of you who have never been there, this is a picture of the National Archives taken yesterday. Uh, and I, have, I can uh, swear that there is only minimal manipulation in that picture. It was sunny yesterday in London. Uh, but uh, so the National Archive as an institution, you may think, and it is quite uh, typical for people to think that the National Archive is a place that holds books because people confuse archives and libraries. Forget about books. You may think that, oh, no, no, National Archives are places that keep dusty things. Do not ever tell uh, an archivist that they have dust because that is basically accusing them of professional um, uh, fault. You know, there is no dust in the National Archives. There are old things, but they're not dusty because if there's dust, they have failed. What they do do, Ivor, is keep the record. That's what... Uh, archives do, national archives even more so, they keep the records for you know, a place, a country, a region, so on and so forth. And I would argue that what they really do is keep data, because the, what they do is not just preserve artifacts, it is, it is holding a catalogue of that record. And it's, um, it's something that used to be relatively easy. You kept, a re you kept the things and you kept a record of the things when the things were physical artifacts. But in the past uh, few decades and uh, at various speeds depending on, on countries and archives, you have a world that is increasingly hard because they're no longer just keeping archives of things that are kept in box and that you, know, you don't lose those boxes too easily. But now that you, you have things that are records that are digitized, it is that their, their work has become much, much, much harder. And, you know, they're not uh, immune to criticism. This is a, a capture uh, of uh, the page uh, in a, a national newspaper on the National Archives. And it, it has quite a few articles saying, whoops, what happened to those records? So let's get back to that notion of, of trust and let's get to a scenario of where the job of a National Archive is particularly hard. Uh, it, for my first exhibit here, and the text is a little bit uh, small, so I'm, I'm going to read it out to you. Um, this is from the Public Records Act 1958, which, along with the uh, Freedom of Information Act here in the UK, constitutes kind of the, the, the legal basis for a lot of what uh, a National Archive does, and it says that Basically, the, the keeper of the record needs to not just keep the record, but actually be able to certify that the thing that they are keeping is true. Now, that's, that's quite hard because typically they are given things to keep. They can't say whether it's true, but their job is basically to say that whatever they received later on is still the same thing. So I'm not going to get into metaphysical discussions about whether a ship that is replaced part by part is still the same thing. We're talking about documents mostly here, but it's still really, really hard because, and this is an example that is quite extreme, uh, but because uh, a lot of the records that uh, places like the National Archive keeps are half open, half closed. Uh, those here who are familiar with the ODI will know that we think a lot in that, on that spectrum between open and closed. But in this case, we have something that is slightly hybrid in that the, the record is public. It's a public record of something that has happened. The description that is the, uh, the metadata about that record is open. That is, you know it's there. But the actual artifact, the actual uh, statement is closed for 100 years. Now that one is slightly extreme, but actually for a lot of the governmental public record, the uh, typical practice is for those records to be closed for 20 years. And, and in, a lot of, in a lot of cases, you've got an open description that says, yes, we have received from this department this record and we'll open it in 20 years. In 20 years, you will be able to see it. And then you've got things like freedom of information, uh, access rights, and so on and so forth. But typically, it means that for 20 years, they're going to be in, in a box, virtual box, because these are now digital uh, records, but you have an open description. This is me trying to uh, 
put in picture what is happening here. You have an original document that, it put, that is put in the closed archive with a public catalog, so a public uh, description of the, of the thing. And 20 years later, you, uh, the, the archive, the thing, becomes public and you can retrieve it. And the goal, the mission, is to allow um, a observer, visitor, to check that the original is the same as the retrieved document. Now, if you trust the National Archive, jump done. They say so, you're done. The, the project that I want to talk to you about today is to try and figure out how we can help uh, those archives do that job of stating and proving that the thing hasn't changed in those 20 years through a little bit of clever technology. Bec and the, the reason we do that, uh, the project is called Archangel, and it is a, um, a, a partnership between us at the ODI with the National Archives and uh, the University of, of Surrey as uh, the ones that do most of the really clever technology that I'm going to talk about. The, re the, the reason uh, this is hard is that typically if you want to prove that a document hasn't changed, what you do is that you use uh, some relatively well-established math to create what you call a hash of that document. It looks at, at the bytes in the document. Remember, we're talking about a digital document, so PDF, a Word document, a text file, an image, whatever. But the, that file is a bunch of zeros and ones. You apply some mathematics, and you can create a unique signature of those ones and zeros, which means that one set of ones and zeros get to this particular signature, and if you change one pixel in the image, the signature is completely different, okay? And so for documents, then you have that ability through mathematics, you know, all open, uh, all well done, uh, well known algorithms to check the signature 20 years later. So if you have put that signature when you deposit the, uh, the document, you can then retrieve the, the, the document 20 years later, check the sig signature against what was put in the in the database at the beginning, check that they're the same, and you're done. So, job done. Except you've got two problems. The first problem is that problem of trust. What if you don't actually trust that um, the National Archives have not been kind of fiddling with the record? What if you think, well, yeah, sure, Today I'm checking this and the National Archive tells me that this signature is the same as that signature, but what if actually what they put in was something slightly different and then they changed it 10 years ago and they kind of just changed the signature and they're pretending that it's been there for 20 years, but I wasn't there 20 years ago. I don't have any proof that it has been there for 20 years. All I have is their word that the signature is the same and it has been the same for 20 years. Problem number one. Problem number two a lot of the types of records that um, the, uh, something like the National Archives keeps is not just uh, static documents. It is things like this, men in wigs blabbering for two hours about really important things. So this is a, a record of the, um, the Supreme Court. Uh, and what many of you probably know, but if you don't, I'm just going to try and explain it quickly, is that the formats for things like videos change over time. There is probably not a lot of uh, formats for digital video that worked 20 years ago that still work today. If you had computers and did, uh, uh, and had videos on a computer 20 years ago, it was probably, I don't know, Real Player or something like that, and it's changed now, and now it's MPEG-4 and things like that. Which means that over the 20 years, that the National Archive have had to keep the thing, they can't just say, oh, well, yeah, well, here's, here's a video in, in that uh, antiquated format that we uh, deposited 20 years ago. You can read it. Oh, no, you can't read it because there's no software that does it anymore. So their job is not just to keep the thing, but to keep the thing usable. Therefore, they're going to transcode it. They're going to sh shift formats over those years that they're going to preserve the, 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 the document. But of course, as I said earlier, if you change the file or if you change the format, that signature of ones and zeros is going to change, right? And so we're in the, in, in, in the exact same scenario, as I was saying earlier with a kind of uh, conspiracy theory problem, whereby 
Well, the signature that comes at the end for the, for the document that I retrieved is not the same as the one that I had to begin with. It's changed, and I have to trust that the archive has done its job and not filled with it. And, you know, generally you're going to trust them. But in some cases, what if they've been pressured to, you know, edit a few seconds of it to remove something that is quite uh, problematic for, let's say, whoever's in power at the moment? So, how do you fix those two problems? This is where I, uh, I get the buzzwords out. Uh, I'm now going to first talk about how you fix the second problem, the problem of um, that video format shifting. Uh, you can do that through artificial intelligence. And here's me being a, a, being a, a pretending that I'm very smart. Uh, this is a, 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 a diagram that... Uh, uh, someone at the University of Surrey has been working on uh, and it explains how essentially you can create a, a deep neural network system, a machine learning system that learns the difference between what happens when you shift a format. So when you shift format from let's say uh, a video that it has at 24 frames per, per second to 25, then you create some artifacts, you, have, you add a little bit of noise, but they, they learn to understand the difference between that kind of noise and the noise that is being created or the changes that are being created when you actually are doctoring that video to make it uh, sound different. So you can create a model that knows the difference between doctoring and noise, essentially. And that is really, really, really hard. Three, uh, three reasons why it's really, really, really hard. One is, uh, well, it is. It really is. <laughs> and case in point, um, you, there, there are some, some such systems for content, what is called content hashing, which is different from kind of byte level zeros and ones hashing uh, in, uh, in use for things like YouTube to detect whether a video is one that is copyrighted. So if you upload a video, it's going to say, ah, it looks a lot like that video, which is copyrighted. Therefore, things happen. You know, same kind of same, same use case, figuring out whether this thing is kind of the same as that thing. And even then, in the case of that uh, Google Content ID, in which, on which they, they have invested $100 million, and it's still imperfect, probably because it will never be perfect. And their use case is actually much simpler than the use case that we have with the archive. Because with the archive, both <laughs> false positives and false negatives are unacceptable. Let me explain that. False, uh, the false negative, so the idea that um, the, do the, the system that we've put in place would fail occasionally to detect tampering. If the system fails to detect tampering, it is useless. If it goes, oh yeah, that looks legit to me, and, there in, and if there is that kind of you know, two frames changed, sped up to make it look like the person is doing a character chop rather than a, than a push, it's really, really hard. It's really, really subtle, but if you fail to detect that, then well, the trust in that the usefulness of the system to help you figure out whether or not the thing has been tampered goes down dramatically. And likewise, false positives are also really, really complicated because basically if the system says, yeah, I'm not sure, maybe it's been doctored, you, you should probably check manually for absolutely everything, then, well, what use is it? It means that basically someone, someone trustworthy ideally, is going to have to manually check that the things are the same. Therefore, the automated system doesn't do much at all. Now, of course, you can, you can have acceptable thresholds of errors, but in typical machine learning systems, you would have a choice of false positives are more acceptable than false negatives, and you would, have a, you would, you would say, well, I want a 80% on one and 95% on the other. But if you say, no, actually, I want 99% or 99.99999% on both, you have a very, very hard system. So that's something that is being developed at the University of Surrey. Uh, if you really want more details on it, there will be a paper that actually explains this thing. I'm not going to try and explain it, and I probably don't have the time anyway. I want to get back to the other use case that we've been trying to, to, to resolve. Uh, the, uh, let's call it the, uh, the Fox Mulder uh, use case. Um, and for that, the solution is blockchain. Now, anyone who knows me or knows the position of the ODI on 
blockchains are going to go, really? The answer is really. But, the, but it's quite, uh, so it's quite important to understand why we've been quite, let's just say skeptical about blockchains, that, is that there's a lot of buzz around it, but mostly uh, blockchains, um, distributed ledger technology, is misunderstood and I would argue misused. If you want a metaphor, the problem we've got with blockchains, this is a printing press, well this is actually a, I think it's pencil sharpener that is made to look like a printing press. That, never mind. The metaphor here, <coughs> nothing to do with pencil sharpeners, is that at the moment we are at the point where we're understanding blockchains, distributed ledger technologies, as the thing that is used to print Bibles. And if your, your thinking is that blockchains are only used to print Bibles, you miss the point of the printing press. The printing press today is not there to just print Bibles. And if your point is, that, well, printing press equals Bibles, then you're missing the point. For the same reason, thinking that blockchains are only used for cryptocurrency, you've heard of probably Bitcoin or Dogecoin or IPOs and speculation. If you think that uh, blockchains are only useful for cryptocurrency, you're thinking Bibles and you're making a mistake. But if you go back to what it is that makes a blockchain work, you have basically three important components. One is basically data storage. Strictly speaking, it's a ledger. It is a record of transactions. So that's why it's being used a lot for currency, because you know, if you've got transactions, then you can, you can have transactions of where that money is moving around. It is distributed, it's in the name, DLT, Distributed Ledger Technology, meaning that everyone has a copy. And because it is distributed, it is considered immutable, which strictly speaking is not com completely true, but it is basically very, very hard to fiddle with, that's a technical term, because there are some clever mathematical ways that make it really, 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 really hard to make any change without having uh, more than half of the uh, members of the network agree with you. So a transaction will only go through and be written into everyone's copy of the ledger if m the majority agrees. Which means that if you want a, a blockchain to be useful, then ideally you will want uh, a number of actors to have the same goal as you do. So here, and that is part of the core of what we've done with Archangel, we've got the idea that rather than save the signature of the artifact that you are preserving for 20 years or 100 years into your public catalog and say, trust me, I haven't fiddled with that catalog and that signature of the document, you can put it into an immutable ledger which means that 20 years later, assuming that that technology is still working 20 years later, you would be able to retrieve the signature to uh, generate the signature for the document you retrieve, compare them, and then it would be relatively trustworthy because you would go, okay, well, if it's the same signature, or in the case of a video, if the generation uh, or that, uh, that this machine learning system allows me to do gives me the same signature, I am now reasonably confident that the thing hasn't been doctored. But that only works if everyone, or at least most of the people working on uh, using this blockchain and participating in it, uh, maintains it in their own interest. Which is why, and it gets a little bit into, in, into details, we haven't chosen to use one of the public blockchains. So the public blockchains, like the Bitcoin blockchain or the Ethereum blockchain, are basically open for anyone to, to participate in. We decided instead that it would be much more interesting to create what we call a permissioned blockchain, which is a blockchain that everyone can see. So the reading of the blockchain is open to anyone, but it is permission in that the people who are able to create transactions and validate transactions are all national archives. So we've been running a pilot with uh, archives in a few countries. Uh, really quite proud because it's on many continents. 
Uh, we've got uh, people from Australia, uh, people from uh, uh, Nara in the US, people from Norway, uh, Estonia, and, uh, and a couple of archives here in the UK to get the sense of whether, whether it works. And the, the answer is, it kind of does. But it only does to the extent that people who participate in this understand what blockchains do, which is still kind of a mixed bag. But the, the participants, amongst the participants of this trial that we did, the ones that do understand blockchain, they get it. They get it. They get the fact that by being a node in that network of blockchains, that they not only have something that is quite nice because it's distributed. So the, the signatures for the documents that they input into their catalog aren't just copied locally for them. It is, it is copied elsewhere. In terms of preservation, that's a big bonus. But also, it is an interesting way to collaborate without having to fully trust everyone because it would take at least half of the institutions that work on this to, to decide to fiddle with something for the, to, to give them the ability to, uh, to doctor one of the records. So they don't have to massively trust each other. They just have to trust that, well, generally, it is in their general interest for them all to, to bolster the trust collectively so that each of them can then benefit from the trust by saying, well, it would have been really, really hard to convince those, all those archives to fiddle with this. And you end up with that doctored uh, signature. And therefore, by having a network of kind of loosely trusting, trusted organizations, you end up with something that I think that might be a bit of a, an overstatement and apologies to uh, a certain Danish uh, beer company. I think, and I, I'm, I'd be happy for anyone to challenge me, that this is probably the only useful artificial intelligence and blockchain system in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, time for questions now. Just to remind you that um, the mic doesn't amplify your voice, but it just enables people watching on the live stream to hear you. So I pass you the mic, please speak up. Um, and uh, if you're watching the live stream, please use hashtag ODI Fridays and I will read out your question. Do we have any questions to kick off from the audience? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, John Denton here. Um, I've got a comment and a question. Comment is, uh, I came here to think about the archives, but I actually used to work in media and. Philips had a watermarking system that mm -hmm. watermarked video that you could tell if it being cut. Anyway, I don't know why that's not perhaps it, part it, of yeah, it, tracking. It, it's the similar to so the, the, the whole idea of watermarking digital signatures. It's, we're in that that's world, right. definitely. Right. Uh, the question I had was um, um, in terms of different data sets in different archives that mm -hmm. you're looking at, how varied are they and how much would they need to be already? kind of cleanse to be similar or not if you were using the blockchain to kind of track them? They wouldn't have to. Uh, so the, the pilot that um, we just ran for, for a month, um, hopefully I'm not saying anything confidential, but we had, uh, uh, so, yeah, just uh, re redact the whole thing. Uh, um, no, basically it is, it is fairly agnostic because all your storing is metadata about which of the actors is storing this metadata and the signature. And the signature is, in, in, in most cases, just a 256 uh, character hash when it comes to fairly static documents. Uh, and when it comes to the, um, the signatures uh, for videos, it's a little bit more complicated, but basically what we store are hashes of the machine learning model. So the end, it ends up being basically reduced to a signature that is consistent whatever actually you've put into your archive. We don't put the actual artifacts in the blockchain because you don't want that. And in some cases, you don't put much metadata at all because in some cases, um, and I showed you earlier the, the idea of a record that is closed with an open description. But in some cases, you don't actually want the, the description to be open. The file name itself might be a giveaway for something that is confidential and will be for decades to come. But you may want to still go and say, I receive a thing. I'm not going to say what it is, but here's the signature for it. And of course, from the signature, you cannot 
you cannot figure out what it is. That's the, that's the beauty of the mathematics of hashes, is that you cannot guess what the thing is that you've uh, generated the, uh, that signature from. But later on, you can, you can open the description and the artifact and go, there you go, this, this is the thing, and you can still generate that signature and compare it. But it, it is completely agnostic to whatever uh, it is that you put in there. So it doesn't actually have to be uh, done at the Na National Archive level, but uh, we think it's useful for that kind of social aspect of National Archives that they are, um, they are there to be trusted to keep the record. But you can, you can, you can have um, archival and other types of record keeping uh, users beyond National Archives. Does that answer your question? Yeah, the fact there's no legal... In fact, you know, the immediate one, I guess, is case law yeah. and paralegal with AI would be... Yeah, I think, that, I think you're right. Thank you. Any more question in the audience? I've got a question. Um, is this in response to any particular demand that's come from anywhere? Or is it done because it's something that's right to do? Uh, yes, uh, a little <laughs> bit of both. So is it, uh, is it the right thing to do? Well, we now have, so having worked on this for a couple of years and, and tried it, um, we think that there's a there there, there's, there's something, it's not just a, uh, a solution in search of a problem. It could have been, it could have been that we just were going, oh yeah, let's, let's try and find a way to, uh, to use the blockchain and AI to help National Archives and fall flat on our face, that would be a possibility, but we think there's, there's something there that technology can help bolster trust. It doesn't replace the trust in the institution entirely, but it can help. Um, is there a demand for it? There is, but it varies in that um, the world of big archives and national archives are really disparate in their uh, maturity with um, digital preservation. Uh, we're lucky to work with the National Archives here in the UK and they're really quite good at it already and they get it and they were partners in this project from the get-go. Uh, we've talked to people in, uh, as I said, you know, uh, uh, in Norway, Estonia, the US, uh, Australia, and they get it. They, they, they are quite mature in that. But a lot of National Archives, they're going to look at this and they're going to go, how does this help with my box of stuff? And the answer is, well, not really. You need to get to the points of you know, digitization, uh, 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 digital record keeping uh, uh, through time. And then we can talk about getting uh, uh, integrity check within uh, your workflows once you're there. So the demand is there, but only in a, at the moment, a small group that are really thinking hard about what digital preservation over time really means. Does that mean that there's potentially a skills gap Sort of resource gap yeah. that yeah. needs to be filled. Yeah, essentially. I'm not, I am not an expert in, in, in digital preservation. I'm not going to pretend to be, but as far as I can understand, uh, there's, a, there's a big... Uh, it's, it's really hard when you're used to preserving physical objects and keeping a catalogue on paper to move to uh, artefacts that you need to preserve but that are um, not only... Um, uh, they're not physical, but they have to change. The whole idea that you have to format shift those things over time. Uh, actually, in, in, in media, there's a little more of a, of a history of that. Um, if you talk to, you know, if you talk to the BBC, for instance, they, they would have that, that work of having digitized their archive and working on that. But a lot of archives, they're just like, I've just bo got boxes of things that I need to keep, uh, keep. Uh, intact for a long time. How does this actually help me? And you really need, it's not just skills, it's, it's awareness and it's a whole journey towards um, kind of thinking digitally and thinking, uh, as I said at the very beginning, thinking that their work is actually uh, a work of keeping data, but at scales of volume and time that, that makes them really at the forefront of the kind of uh, the, 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 the practice of, of data. That which is why it's, it's quite exciting for us to think about data storage, but not just uh, real time, but for centuries. Thank you. Question over here. Um, could you see or, or see this being used um, within or across media outputs and seeing media companies and organizations, press agencies, 
building some kind of partnership to put, I don't know, like that video that you showed, whoever publishes that first, it gets put on a blockchain and then you can see how things get changed. I have no idea how that would work alongside the machine learning example you gave at the beginning, but could that be a way of proving that, you know, this is a fake, that's not a fake? So for those of you who don't know, this is Alex uh, um, at the ODI. And uh, I swear that I haven't told Alex <laughs> about this, but this is one of our next steps. We actually want to uh, find applications in other places. And we think that uh, journalists uh, in particular are a really, really um, a good uh, constituency to work with because they have that problem of uh, they generate quite a lot of content and their content being doctored for political, cultural uh, gains is, is a big problem for them. So them being able to semi-automatically guarantee integrity of their material is massively important. So it, it, is, it is a group we want to work with uh, as a next step. Yes. Any more questions? No? Okay. I think we'll draw to a close. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you very much. Um, next week we have um, a lunchtime lecture uh, from Lloyd's Register Foundation on does safety tech save lives. So uh, please join us for that. But in the meantime, please, please uh, join me to thank Olivier again. <laughs>